What's going on, everybody? Curtis Wilkerson here with Hog Hoops Live. Another episode today. Looking forward to talking to you. We got a lot going on with Arkansas basketball. A lot's changed since the last time we've been on this show. Arkansas has won three in a row, kind of worked their way back into a discussion. Keith Smart got himself a W in Baton Rouge. Coach Muss is back. The streak is dead. Hogs have some revenge on their minds this weekend. We're going to talk about all of it and a little bit more today on Hog Hoops Live. All righty, everybody, real quick, I want to remind you guys of all the ways to watch and listen. You know the drill. You can join us on Facebook Live. Be sure to give us a follow there. Also available on YouTube. Remember, Hog Hoops Live has its own YouTube page. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Uh, podcast listeners, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, you can find us right there where you have Hog Sports Live with Trey Biddy every week. Okay. I apologize if I sound a little stuffy or sickly today. Woke up feeling a little bit under the weather this morning for some reason. I timed up my, I took some tea, all right, T- tried to time it up to where it will get rid of the cough and I can get through the show before I pass out, fall asleep, right? Bear with me a little bit, but the show must go on. If Eric Musselman can coach in a sling less than a week after having rotator cuff surgery, I can talk with a sore throat. Let's go. You know, came on last week almost immediately after the news broke about Muss undergoing surgery to repair that torn rotator cuff after the big win over Missouri. Key Smart took over in the interim. Really, I thought he just did an incredible job. You know, he took the Hogs down to Baton Rouge, his hometown, by the way, uh, to play number 12 at the time, LSU. It's the top defensive team in the country. They're 15-1. and one. You know, Obviously, we know Arkansas picked up the win over Will Wade's crew down there. And I know there's a more recent game that I want to spend more time talking about, but I do want to hit on a couple things from this LSU game because we haven't had a, an episode since then. You know, first, I think that this was a massive win, obviously, for Arkansas. It, it's one thing to kind of get out of the ditch a little bit against Missouri. We talked about that last week, but, you know, the Hogs needed that signature win for the resume. They needed to make a statement, and they did that. We'll talk about what that means you know, for the resume more specifically in a few minutes, but I think it's safe to say that it provided quite the boost. You know, we know Key Smart has all the NBA experience and, and background, but what him and the staff did I think was extremely impressive. I do want to give a couple shout-outs before we move on to South Carolina. You know, first, speaking of that staff, assistant coach Gus Arginal, you know, he was given the defensive game plan for LSU, and, and I really thought he nailed it. You know, Arkansas knew that they weren't winning that game at LSU if Darius Day has got off. We've seen it. When when he's good against Arkansas, LSU beats him. When he's not, Arkansas wins. It's just the way it is. They absolutely shut him down. Great job. Kind of a collective effort. Trey Wade, Aldis Tony, Amude, Jalen Williams, everybody got a little bit of time on him. Arkansas opted to go heavy switch on the perimeter, which really limited the Tigers from three. I thought that was huge. You know, we knew that that points would be at a premium against LSU, but it it didn't matter because of how well Arkansas played defensively themselves. And and so now, you know, moving on to Keith Smart, you know, one of the things he said leading up to that game was that, you know, he was running all his thoughts, his decisions, leading up to it past Muss, obviously. But he, he was kind of given the green light to coach his way, you know, instill his style, his personality a little bit. And and look, there's no, I mean, there's no tried and true method. Every game, I think, can be won or lost with different approaches. But I, I think what Key Smart brought to the table at LSU was critical. He's calm, he's cool and collected, and that really trickled down, I think, to the team in a really hostile road environment. It was definitely the most hostile road environment that, that they faced so far this season. A couple examples of that that really stood out to me, uh, you know, one, right out of the gates, Arkansas falls down 9-2. to two. Uh, They looked a little bit disconnected, kind of back on their heels a little bit. We know Musselman doesn't really – he's been calling more timeouts this year. Uh, but traditionally, he doesn't like to do that, especially early in games. Key Smart calls a timeout, talks him through it, and then the Hogs settle in. Played a lot better after that. 
I thought he did a nice job of managing his subs, uh, especially with, you know, J.D. Note was in some foul trouble there. So I, I thought, you know, he did a good job of, of getting the right guys in there, putting the right pieces together to keep Arkansas within striking distance with their leading score out of the game. And then obviously had him in down the stretch. You know, Arkansas got down eight points with nine minutes to go. Things really could have unraveled there on the road. We've seen it at times this year. Um, <laughs> Key Smart calls a timeout. He puts the team through a breathing exercise during the timeout to calm them down, get them refocused, makes a couple adjustments, and boom, 17-2 to two run to close that thing out, give Arkansas their biggest win of the year. So kudos to him. Uh, Jalen Williams, J.D. Note were phenomenal in that game. Big one for Arkansas. Moving on. Because we had South Carolina last night. You know, we've talked about it, and and these wins are great. You know, last time, Arkansas just needed to get one, right? I mean, they were 0-3 in SEC play. You beat a, a Missouri team that's not very good, but you needed a feel-good moment. You needed to get a win, right? But the Hogs do have some ground to make up because of some of these earlier stumbles. And so what they needed is they keep building momentum, right? Let this thing start snowballing a little bit. Maybe like last year, they're going to rattle off 12 in a row in SEC play. I don't know about all that, but you want to rattle off as many as you can. Keep building that momentum, that confidence. So back home last night to take on a, a you know, a South Carolina team. Not, they're not the, <laughs> you know, they're not the best team in the SEC, but you know the drill with a Frank Martin coach basketball team. They're tough. They're physical. They're hard-nosed. They're going to pound on you. They're going to grind on you. It's going to be a war. You know that going into it. And, hey, listen, at the end of the day, Arkansas did what it needed to do. Held serve at home, 75-59 to 59 win. There was a lot going on with this one. First of all, you know, Eric Musselman's back, right? Coach Muss back on the sidelines for this one. Uh, you know, in a sling, essentially, he coached the whole game. I kind of had a feeling he was going to be back. <clears throat> I kind of had a feeling he was. You know, to me, it's it's one thing to get on an airplane and go down to Baton Rouge and leave him, right? You, coach can't get on the plane, stay home. But when you get back to your home arena, what's he going to do? Sit on the couch? Sit in the stands? Come on, man. We knew he was coming back. If he could move around, if he was physically able to, I kind of I kind of had a hunch that that was going to happen. But man, I mean, you know, obviously he's less than a week removed from surgery, still hurting, got off he got off the pain meds early because they were making him sick to his stomach, nauseous. You could tell his normal energy wasn't there. He wasn't feeling great, definitely not 100%. But he led Arkansas to the win. And an interesting win it was, right? You'd actually think Maybe that Arkansas lost if you hopped on Twitter because, damn it, the streak has finally ended. It's over. 33 years. I'm 33 years old. 1,092 straight games with a made three-pointer for the Razorbacks. The third longest streak in the nation behind UNLV and Duke snapped. It's over. Just like that. Hogs went 0-11 from beyond the arc last night. You know, you could hear the crowd down the stretch of the game. They're getting a little restless. You're starting to hear some chants every time Arkansas will get the ball back. You're three, three. I think maybe Coach Z let Muss know actually in the last couple minutes, like, hey man, we gotta be kind of nice to hit a three here and keep this thing going. And look, there's nothing I would have loved more to see, you know, JD take a step across half court and stick one or Kate Arbogast getting there and, and drill a three right at the end of the game. I mean, that would have been awesome. Could you imagine that? The walk-on comes in and saves the streak. That would have been lit. That would have been awesome. But I get it. You know, you aren't you aren't going to force the issue. It's about winning the game that's in front of you. For me, the, the question I think is how in the world do you win a game in the SEC period, much less by 16 points without making a three. I think for one, you make 27 free throws. And that's that simple math, I think. That's the equivalent of nine threes right there, right? 
Now, listen, like I said, Arkansas knew South Carolina was going to foul them a ton. They foul more than any high major program in the country. South Carolina sends teams to the free throw line 23 times a game. Arkansas goes there 23 times a game. So they took advantage of that, 27 to 33 at the line. That was huge. The second part of that is, is you limit the opponent for making threes themselves so you aren't trading threes for twos. And it wasn't great, you know, in the in the first half. We'll talk about it in a sec. But you kind of started to see some of those, um, you know, not so good signs from earlier in the year kind of creep back in. One was the three point defense right away. I think South Carolina was six of thirteen, six of thirteen, five. I think that was right. They hit six in the first half, eh. but they held South Carolina to one of ten after the break. And you know, one thing I saw with that is Arkansas blocked it at least three or four perimeter jump shots. That's hard to do. That's rare. But, you know, what that tells me is that the Hogs, I think, are starting to contest and defend the perimeter the way that Musselman's been preaching it. I think that was a really positive sign, especially in the second half. Arkansas won the turnover battle. Forced 18 out of South Carolina and only coughed it up. The I think the more important number is Arkansas only coughed it up 11 times themselves. That's a really good number against the Gamecocks. They force a lot of turnovers. Arkansas only had you know 11 turnovers. Like I said, I think that's a good number. Arkansas only had eight assists, which is too low. But I think you have to consider in this case that. 27 of your points, of your 75 points, came from free throws. So in a lot of cases with those, that happens at the rim, right? How many free throws did Jalen Williams, she shot 10 free throws? Well, pretty much all of those were him getting an entry pass or a dump off and going up and getting fouled. So someone made that pass that resulted in the foul that ultimately resulted in the points. So you don't get assists for that, but it's still sharing the basketball. So I think that eight on the assist number is a little bit skewed. I think I think the ball sharing was a little bit better than that. I think Must said they had 256 passes. That's a great number. <clears throat> you know, Arkansas did give up 15 offensive rebounds. That's too many, right? And and that was uh, one of the key factors coming into the game. South Carolina leads the league in offensive rebounding. They were just under 14 per game. They got 15. Uh, but the thing about it was they only turned that into 12 second-chance points. So if, if you're going to give up offensive rebounds, uh, the least you could do is is keep the opponent from converting them. I thought Arkansas did a really nice job, especially in the second half, of walling up and, and getting big and crowding those guys when they came down with an offensive rebound or, or tipping it back up out of their hands after they secured it so there weren't many easy putbacks. That was a key factor. Yeah, it, it, was, it was dicey for a little while there. You know, Arkansas actually trailed by seven. At the half, what forty to thirty-three? I think it was. Um, two things with that. I think one, it took a while early for the Hogs to adjust to how physical South Carolina plays. It, it doesn't mean that Arkansas is not a tough or physical team. South Carolina is a bunch of hacks, and I, I mean that in the nicest way possible. But there, there are no cheap drives or cheap buckets on them. Those dudes get in your grill. They make contact. They foul you. And a bunch of them get called, but also a bunch of them don't. That's just kind of the nature of the beast. So th that was part of it. But Arkansas still had the lead. It, you, you kind of felt comfortable when things got dicey. <laughs> you know, it was when at the 11-minute mark of the first half, Jalen Williams goes to the bench with two fouls. The last seven-plus minutes, you're also without J.D. Note. He goes down with two fouls. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, Especially right now, when Arkansas doesn't have at least one of those two on the floor, they aren't very good. So, whatever, you know, you're, you're down at half. What do you do? You have to respond. And I was really, re I mean, pleasantly surprised with the way Arkansas came out of the break. We've talked about their struggles starting the second half at, at times this year. Hawks came out, I thought, with incredible energy. They were aggressive on both ends. 18 to 1 run over 6 minutes and and really took full control of the game. It's what you got to do. You know, so many people are upset about Arkansas not hitting a 3. 
another streak was broken last night that gets under my skin more than that, and it's the fact that Jalen Williams was stuck on nine rebounds for the last two minutes and 12 seconds of that game and was robbed of his fourth consecutive double-double. It's unacceptable. I've, I've been on the Jalen Williams double-double bandwagon since before he recorded the first one of his career. The man gets three in a row. The whole team should have been boxing out for him and clearing the lane to let him get the 10th rebound. It's crazy. I joke. Seriously, he was phenomenal, though, wasn't he? He was great. You know, a, a career high, and this is with, by the way, missing the last 11 minutes of the first half with two fouls, so get a little bit better at that, but career high 19 points, nine rebounds. You know, the, the thing that stood out to me more than anything with Jalen, South Carolina ran quite a bit of, like, Full court, three quarter court press, a zone look. They'd bring a trapper. Typically, when that happens, your big man is all the way back underneath the rim, right? If you break the press, you get numbers, you dump it off to him, boom, for a layup. Not the case with Jalen Williams. He was in the back court with JD Note helping get the ball across. I, I think that just tells you how unique his skill set is. The Hogs really did struggle with him off the floor. The two fouls are going to happen in the first half from time to time. I mean, with nearly 12 minutes to go, though, against a team like South Carolina, especially that they're just so they're so heavy on the offensive glass. But Arkansas hung in there. Trey Wade, Stanley Mude, Aldis Tony, those guys stepped up on the glass while he was out. J.D. Note, you know, it's funny, I, I do those player grades, and uh, a lot goes into that, you know, but a, a lot of people got pissed that I gave J.D. Note an A for this game, and look, I, I get it, I do, four turnovers is too many, it is, I know that, I see that, he got two fouls, he had to set the last seven to eight minutes of the first half, clearly, you need that man to stay on the floor, no argument for me. But, man, at the end of the day, I just I can't ignore the difference in this team when he's playing and when he's not. So, yeah, he missed a stretch there, but when he was on the floor, he made more of an impact than anybody. In the 11 minutes he was not in the game, Arkansas was minus 15, outscored by 15 to South Carolina. For the 29 minutes he did play, which is still a lot, by the way, Arkansas was plus 31. That's insane, but that's par for the course for what J.D. Note has been given this team. He had four turnovers. He's also responsible for over half of the team's assists. Several big defensive plays. He played all 20 minutes after halftime, which I think is the most important stretch, right? He had 14 points, four of his five assists, three blocks. He, he was a catalyst for pretty much everything that was going right for Arkansas when they came back and got control of that game. So to me, that's more critical than missing time in the first half. I agree with the argument. I'm just saying the impact he makes, you can't replace that. And, and you got to think about, you know, what's being asked of this guy right now. And it's something else I considered. You know, right now, Arkansas is basically asking J.D. and Hote, we need you to play 40 minutes. We need you to lead the team in scoring. We need you to facilitate the offense as a point guard while being surrounded for significant stretches by no other ball handlers. And, and we also need you to continue to be one of, the one of if not the best perimeter defender on the team um, in the SEC. That's a lot on the man's shoulders, so I can overlook a couple early fouls and, and you know maybe a couple too many turnovers if he's accepting all those challenges, and, and I think he did. A quick shout out to a couple other guys, Aldis Tony, Stanley Amude. I, I thought they both made some really critical contributions in that win. Tony had 13 and 8. Uh, Stan had, I think, 12 and 6. I really liked their activity levels on the glass, around the rim. But what really stood out to me, those two guys, is what they did on the defensive end. We've seen flashes of that from Tony, maybe not so much with Stan. But both of those guys had plays that really impressed me. I mean, even just looking at the box score, Tony had three steals. Amude had two blocks and two steals. That, that's good enough right there. But aside from that, 
both of those guys had more than one play where they cut their man off on the dribble drive and he'd either pick up a travel, kick it out of bounds. It created a turnover. You know, to talk about Stan, I mean, he started at the three and then he played the four and the five. You know, he plays playing three different positions for you. Um, you know, Tony was an animal in the glass, five offensive rebounds. I just thought it was a really nice job by those two guys. And, and if you can get that, I know I sound like a broken record with this, but if you can get that from those two guys consistently to go with what you pretty much know you're going to get from J.D. and Jalen Williams at this point, man, you're in a, a pretty good spot, don't you think? And, you know, here's the deal that, I mean, there's there's still some issues, right? Arkansas is back, baby, but they're not all the way back. Not yet. Still a work in progress. They didn't have to last night, but Arkansas is going to have to make some threes. You know, better teams aren't going to put you on the line 33 times. Better teams are also going to have more offensive threats than South Carolina did to, to expose you. So, and I know that's kind of a blip on the radar. Arkansas averages, I think, about six, six and a half made threes per game. I think that's fine. That's enough given the other things that they do well. If they can shoot it at, you know, around that 30% clip or so with the occasional hot game, you know, hey, we know this is not, and, and at this point will not be a, a very good three-point shooting team, but you got to have something out there to keep the defense of the defense is honest and and especially if things keep trending in the direction that they are with your top seven or eight guys because if that's the case then it kind of eliminates you know those big minutes that you're getting from Jackson Robinson who maybe was one of the guys that you could count on from three so you're gonna have to be more selective in the ones that you take and, uh, and and cash in on those opportunities. It was kind of a the other thing, you know, it was, it was kind of a quiet night for Devo. He wasn't bad. A little bit of a quiet night. Chris Likes didn't do too much. He he only played 12 minutes. I don't think he played at all in the second half. But I think for this team, it's important that somebody in the backcourt can can help consistently take some of that scoring load off of JD's shoulders and, and play some minutes here and there as the primary ball handler without things going haywire. Because I talked about all the things that, that JD's being asked to do right now. You're going to wear the man down. So somebody's got to be able to step up consistently. We've seen it at times from both of those guys. I think Devo can and will do that. I think he's going to be the guy. He's still finding his way a little bit. Looked, I thought he looked a little bit more comfortable last night. Uh, was mostly moved off ball, which, which at this point I think is is a good thing when he's playing with JD especially. You kind of saw some of those signs of that vintage Devo. You know, he I think he was three of eight from the field, uh, but those three makes. You know, the first one came on you know just a, a well timed basket cut, took the pass, reverse layup. How many times have we seen Devo do that? That's great. And then the other two were those mid range pull ups, and I mean. When, when Devo takes that one dribble inside the arc, pulls up from 15 to 17 feet, I feel like it's going in every single time. Give me more of that. That's a great shot for him, and it's one. I, he, I think he kind of fell into that analytics trap a little bit. He's worked so hard on his three-point shot, and it has improved, but he was kind of in that layup or three mode. And I get it. I know, I know what the numbers say about the long two. No long twos, right? Well... If you can knock that thing down at a high clip, pull up and do it. Jimmy Witt style, right? I hope we keep seeing more of that. It could be huge for this team. You, you, we talk about threes and making threes. Well, yeah, it's one extra point. But one of the biggest parts of that is just being able to spread out the defense to open up driving lanes for everybody else. It just spaces things out. It opens it up for the offense to have more flow and more rhythm. Well, the same thing can be accomplished by Devo knocking down those jumpers because people are going to have to respect that. And if they're spread out, you know, 15 to 17 feet guarding him uh, as opposed to, you know, 19 to 20, it's still giving you more lanes than if they can just completely collapse knowing that all he's going to try to do is drive. 
or shoot a three, which is a lower percentage, they'll, they'll live with that. So I think that's an important shot for him. Chris, a little, I think a little bit, you know, caught in between. He's been challenged to improve defensively. And, you know, quite honestly, I'd argue that he has. Uh, but his scoring is what's really dropped off, and that, that's his best attribute. So if you look at it and you're saying, well, you know, Arkansas needs someone who can take the heat off J.D. as a primary ball handler, someone who can take and make those open threes. Of the guys who are now in the rotation and playing, Chris kind of stands out, don't you think? So again, not a finished product, but man, they're playing a lot better. They're making progress. I, I, I feel a lot better about where this team is at than I did a couple weeks ago, no doubt about it. And where's the turnaround coming from? You know, for me, I credit it to defense. This group getting connected and bought in on the defensive end of the floor. So three wins in a row, take a look at it. That's three straight games holding teams under 60 points. Three straight games holding opponents under 40% shooting from the field. Winning on the backboards and you're turning teams over. That's a, that's a pretty good recipe to being a good team. I, I asked Muss last night after the game, you know, if this is Arkansas's identity, is this what is this going to be this team's DNA? It's calling card because since October, we've been wondering what that was going to be. Maybe this is it, but I asked him and he said flat out that any good team has to be good defensively. That's where it starts. And what he said that really stood out to me is that if you want your season to be meaningful, you have to be good defensively. Well, there you go. It started, I think, with inserting Trey Wade into the starting lineup and sliding Audis Tony up to the two. It just makes Arkansas longer, more physical, more switchable. It's a good combination, and, and especially when Kamani Johnson gets healthy, which I feel like he's got a pretty good chance to get back out there on Saturday. We'll see. But if that happens, it gives you more pop scoring-wise off the bench with guys like Devo and maybe Stanley Mude comes back in in kind of that six-man role. So I think it's a good combination. You know, Trey Wade, he had the big game against, uh, I guess it was Missouri, 17 points. And, you know, since then he hasn't done a whole lot scoring. But he he's kind of that... He's kind of that glue, especially on the defensive end, where you can really rely on him. He's always in the right spots. He's a high IQ player. He moves the ball, doesn't force the issue. Although he did have like a turnaround 16-foot fadeaway. He made it, though, last night. Uh, but he also had one of the biggest plays of the game during that run and starts the second half. Uh, Arkansas misses a couple layups. They're kind of getting hacked in there. Trey Wade goes up, man-sized offensive rebound puts it back through contact for the three-point play that gave Arkansas the lead, and they never look back. It, it's that kind of stuff that he brings to the table. Great communicator. Um, I think he's helped this team a lot. I really do. So, I mean, hey, you know, this three-game winning streak, it's kind of done wonders for the like the, the eye test, the aesthetics of things, right? Doesn't 13-5 and five feel a lot better than 10-5? and five? If you just look at it on paper, it looks better to me. Got back to 500 in SEC play. I know 3-3 three and three looks a hell of a lot better than 0-3. And, and it's important, too. You know, Arkansas went from dead last in the SEC standings a, a, a week ago, literally a week ago from this very moment as, as we record Wednesday at just before 1 p.m., Went from dead last in the standings all the way up to sixth. Sure, I, I think everybody would like to be a little bit higher than that, but it beats being in the basement. You know, we talk about those net rankings, the all-important net rankings. Used for NCAA tournament selection and seeding. Arkansas was on a nosedive. They were all the way down at number 98 one week ago. 
Woke up this morning and checked number 53. 45 spots. That's a that's a big increase. You know, this, a, this was a top 20 team in the preseason that was coming in with all those. And it's, it's a crapshoot. We know that. But those early bracketologies, we were looking at two seeds, three seeds. All of a sudden, Arkansas fell completely off the map, not even in the conversation, not even in the discussion. Right off three wins. Look at it today. Joe Lenardi, the bracketologist guy, expert, has Arkansas in the first four out. So almost right back in the tournament picture. At least they're back in the conversation. Interestingly enough, right above Arkansas on that list, literally one spot above, and right above Arkansas in the net rankings, good old Texas A&M, who comes to Fayetteville this weekend. You, you think Arkansas is going to have a little revenge on the mind for that one? The last loss for the Razorbacks was in College Station a couple weekends ago. You guys remember that one. 86 to 81, Arkansas came out with their hair on fire. JD and Stan combined for the first 20 points of the game, built up a double-digit lead, and then poof. It was like a 20-minute stretch from midway through the first half to midway through the second half that Arkansas just looked lost, disconnected. They gave up the lead before the half, and, and then Texas A&M pulled out. I think they were up by as much as 18 at one point in the second half before Arkansas kind of settled down, and they started chipping away, chipping away, got within one with about a minute left, uh, had the opportunity there where, where Devo was trying to purposely miss the free throw to get an extra possession. So had a chance to win that game, you know, there in the, the final minute, final 30 seconds, came up a little bit short. That's definitely one that Arkansas would like to have back but that rally, you know, at the end of that game, it sort of felt like it could have been the turning point. You felt good about the way that they battled. I wasn't sold yet then because we've, we've seen those spurts, right, of good and bad. So when people were saying that to me, like, hey, you think maybe that that's it? Is, is that what's going to flip the switch and turn the corner? And I was like, oh, I hope so, but I don't know, man. <laughs> hey, they haven't lost since. So maybe they found something there. And Texas A&M, I mean, they're probably the surprise of the SEC, for me at least. I mean, raise your hand if you had the Aggies at 15-2. and two. And, and alongside Auburn as, as one of the only two undefeated teams in the conference. At this point in the season, I didn't expect that. I thought they'd be better, but man, they're hooping. The Aggies do host Kentucky tonight, which Wednesday night, if you're if you're listening later. Um that's an interesting game. Kinda hope I kinda hope Texas AM pulls it off because that'll obviously give them a big boost in the net rankings and, and would look better for Arkansas if they're able to hold serve at home over the weekend. I do think it matters that, you know, Arkansas played last night, Tuesday night, and they get a, an extra full day of prep for Texas AM. Aggies are worried about Kentucky right now. They're not even going to think about Arkansas until Thursday. Now, they've already played, and they played recently. Arkansas is kind of a different team than they were just, I mean, not even two weeks ago. So, we'll see what happens with that. You know, turnovers were a major issue that first go-around. Arkansas turned it over 18 times at College Station, and it, it turned into 28 points on the other end. You just You can't have a repeat of that. It's kind of a weird game. You know, Amude started so hot, he, he fouled out with 13 minutes left. <coughs> Excuse me. That in Texas A&M, in that second half, they shot 61% from the field, 50% from three. It, in that second half there, I mean, whew, they were lighting up. Arkansas's defense has tightened up quite a bit since then. I, I will go out on a limb here and say Texas A&M will not shoot 61% and a half this weekend. But, hey, you know, Buzz Williams has a good team. A lot of options there uh, at guard, good depth. They're selective from three, but they shoot it at a high rate, percentage-wise, that is. Ethan Henderson's return to Fayetteville, right? Big E coming back. 
I mean, it's a, it, this is a Saturday night in Bud Walton Arena. It should be a great crowd. I thought the crowd for the South Carolina game was, was fantastic. I thought it was the best of the season. I was a little worried. There were a ton of students there. The students really showed out. Uh, probably the, the biggest crowd in the student section I've seen this year. Uh, there it wasn't a whole lot beyond that early on, but it was also a 6 p.m. game, so it was kind of a late arriving crowd. People get off work, get in there, you know, maybe right at tip off or a little bit later. Uh, but that place got loud. It got rowdy. And that's what Arkansas needs. I've said it once. I'll say it a million times. If Bud Walton Arena is rocking, you better be 10 points better than the Razorbacks to beat them. Bud Walton Arena was not rocking when Vanderbilt came in there. So... Food for thought. I bet it's going to be a nice crowd. I'm excited for it. It's just a big game. You you can scratch out that earlier loss, kind of a leapfrog opportunity in the standings. A lot of these rankings that we follow get you above water in SEC play, and you just want to you just want to keep the momentum rolling as best as you can before going into another big week when you you travel on the road to Ole Miss. It's you know, Ole Miss isn't great, but they're capable. They really hung tough with Auburn. Arkansas is not a great shooting team. Ole Miss runs a lot of zone. It's kind of a weird building to play in. So, you know, that's a game to keep your eye on. You want to have momentum going into that. And, and then if you handle your business there, hey, you're, you know, going into the final non-conference test of the year over the weekend against a really good West Virginia team. That's going to be an awesome game. Bob Huggins and Gabe O. Coming to Fayetteville. All right. <clears throat> Looks like we got a few questions and comments today. Let's see what we got here. Daryl Brooks says, Woo pig suey, y'all. Yeah. I'm glad Arkansas is, uh, is getting it figured out here on all fronts. I don't know how accurate this is, but I, I did see uh, a few different people share this on, on Twitter it was just the overall winning percentage from uh, 2020, 2021 combined for basketball, football, and baseball in the SEC. And Arkansas had the highest. Kind of makes sense. If you, if you think about what basketball did, baseball won 50 games, football just won nine. So that's pretty cool. Glad the hoop hogs are starting to figure it out a little bit. Buck Willie says, great win, but mad about the streak. Yeah, a lot of people are, are ticked off about it. I get it. I mean, it's pretty cool. 33 years. I mean, it, it's been literally since I've been alive. Someone's been able to, to make note of that after every game Arkansas has played. It's kind of hard to fathom that it goes back that far. I guess they'll just start a new one. Kevin Alexander says if they really wanted to keep the three-point streak alive, they would have set up a play or two for Jackson Robinson, the most pure three-point shooter on the team, <clears throat> and let him give it a go. I may be wrong, but I don't think he even attempted one shot. Yeah, you know, Jacks got in there, what, towards the end of the first half? I think he played like the last three or four minutes of the first half. Didn't get a shot attempt up. I thought maybe they would go to the bench there towards the very end. You know, they were up. 15 plus at that point. Um, like I said, it would have been kind of cool if they had brought the walk on and Cade let him fire one off. Could you imagine? I mean, think about that for a second. You got this streak. Everybody's freaking out about it in the crowd. You bring the walk on and everybody loves that moment anyway. And he just sticks one at the buzzer. They might have stormed the damn court. It would have been awesome. But yeah, it would have been it would have been good to see Jax get involved a little bit there. As much zone as South Carolina was running, I kind of thought we might see more of Jackson. But uh, I think they were pretty pleased with what they were getting out of the other guys defensively. Like I don't I don't know that you could afford at that point to take really anybody who was on the floor off of it down the stretch. But yeah, wish they would have at least. I, I think you're right. Like if they could have at least ran a set play or two to to just try to get a couple looks. That would have been cool. Tony Ball says, calling the Hawks from McCrory, Woo Pig Suey. How about them Jaguars, by the way? State champions, 2A football. Proud alumni right here. How's the basketball team doing? I 
Michelle Robbins says, honestly, I'd take a win in any day over some three-point streak. If threes aren't dropping, you got to be flexible and make adjustments to do what they have to do to win. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that that's very true. I wrote this in my post-game notebook, actually. like, it, it It's a cool streak. It's neat. You like to talk about it. Uh, if it's going to end, at least end in a victory, right? Because if Arkansas goes 0 for 11 and they lose the game by 16 or 1 or whatever, I couldn't imagine the outrage. <laughs> It'd be, it would be crazy. But it turns out you got to the free throw line 33 times, made the best of it, got the win. You know, and, and we asked we asked everybody after the game. We had J.D. and, uh, and Jalen Williams and, you know, Jalen just said, oh, it's, it just happens sometimes, I guess, you know. Muss kind of had the, the comment that I figured he'd have, hey, you know, we're, just, we're trying to win the game. Like, still still attempted 11, didn't make any, so they, you know, they were doing what they had to do to win. I bet if we look far, we're going to have to check in with Hog stats, right, because there has to be some kind of other lengthy streak that the Razorbacks have going right now. Something that we can latch on to because, you know, the three-point streak, I feel like it brought the community together. Oh, well. Kevin, Kevin Medlin says we can't shoot worth crud. Well, I, I can't really disagree with that after last night. But, hey, you know what? Maybe that's just what this team is. Gritty, hard-nosed. They're going to get in your grill and defend you and, and get to the rim and the free throw line. It's going to be ugly, but if they're winning games... I guess we got to take it. I will say, though, and I mentioned this earlier, it is important to be able to knock some of those down, especially if if you if you're thinking about getting into the NCAA tournament and advancing. You got to be able to make some shots. You got to be a threat. Good point to feed off of that. Jason L. Downing says to win in the Big Dance, you have to be good in both halves. This is very true. And, well, I say that, but if we think about Arkansas's run last year, they were terrible in the first half against Colgate. They wound up beating them by 18. They fell behind to, to Texas Tech, rallied back. They were down 10-plus to Oral Roberts. They trailed most of that game, found a way to win. So, But this ain't that team. I think this group definitely has to be a more consistent from half to half kind of group for sure Scott Spruill says no Williams no win he is that important yeah well he's really coming along I mean there's no doubt at this point he's playing his best basketball and he's only really scratching the surface of what he's capable of but I just I just don't think you find too many guys his size who can put it on the floor a little bit who are just that comfortable having the ball in their hands like I said He's helping break the press at 6'10", 240 because he's confident with the basketball and he's a great passer. His charge taking, rebounding, shot blocking, you know, he's kind of had that full mix and the one thing was, well, sure would be nice if he scores it more. Four games in a row in double figures and, and a career high 19 last night. I mean, he's coming a long way. And, and one thing that really stands out to me about that too is he was shooting like sub 60% from the free throw line up until the last couple games. He's way better than that. And and he got that up and he was either nine of 10 or 10 of 11 last night. He's a guy that's going to get fouled and be able to get to the line. And he's a good free throw shooter. I, I think it's a good asset for him too. But yeah, I mean, Arkansas was a different team and not in a good way when he wasn't on the floor. Plain and simple. Jim Lowe says, since we cannot hit from the arc, we have to develop a short jumper a la Jimmy Witt and movement to the basket. Way too much one-on-one -on -one play. Everyone standing around to see if the ball goes in the hoop. Take the ball to the hole. Get a score or a foul. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what they did. You know, we talked about Devo. You know, If he can really start getting to go with that mid-range jumper, he knocked down a couple of them. That's a good shot for him. And that's what Arkansas did. You're right. I mean, they couldn't... <laughs> You know, couldn't buy a three, so in the second half, and Frank Martin said this after the game. You know, he said, what did what adjustments did Arkansas make? What did they do differently in the second half? And he said, hey, they just said, we're driving it at your throat. Stop it. Do something about it. And South Carolina couldn't. 
the emergence of J.D. Note's left hand. How many fa- how many tough drives have he has he finished with his left hand in the last two games? You know we've seen it before, but really efficient with that. And you talked about you talked about the movement off the ball too. Uh, you know, Audis Tony getting back to timing those cuts, getting those finishes around the rim, those dump offs. Those are good signs. Again, you need to be able to knock down some some shots from the perimeter, but if you're excelling in all those other areas, you can mask it to a degree. Michelle says after three wins, what does the team need to do to stay confident but also hungry and grab the win this weekend? Do they stay with the same guys? Um, yeah, you know, I think in terms of you know confidence and and staying hungry, I think a, a good amount of that goes back on the returners because you know Arkansas was in a tough spot, different circumstances, different teams, but a similar spot last year. And I think the leadership and the approach that Justin Smith and Jalen Tate had was really critical to this team. One game at a time approach full focus and effort on the task at hand, not getting ahead of yourselves, staying hungry, staying motivated. And so I think if you're Devo or Jalen Williams or J.D. Note, Connor, KK, any of those guys who were around, you remember that that wasn't easy. Nothing about that was easy. And so you got to bottle up that same energy and not only carry it over, but help kind of set the tone for the rest of the team in doing that. Because some of these guys haven't experienced this before, especially at this level. You know, Chris Likes and Aldis Tony, those guys played in the ACC, but they weren't on winning teams like this. It's a different experience. But I tell you this, they probably like the, the taste of victory a lot more than they do defeat, and that'll motivate you right there. And I also think, you know, Eric Musselman and that coaching staff, they do a really good job just with their preparation of, of keeping them focused on the task at hand, that one game at a time mentality. I think they'll be okay there. Do they stay with the same guys? I don't know. I, I think you do at this point. The only thing I would consider is if, if Kamani Johnson is back and healthy and, and let's say he's practiced the last few days and he looks good, do you reinsert him? Or do you stick with the mood A and, and bring Kamani in off the bench? I, I would, if it was me, I would probably stick with the five they have right now. I like it. I think it's a good group. J.D., Aldis, Tony, Stanley Mude, uh, and then Trey Wade and Jalen Williams. I think that's a good group. I like the pop that Amude brings as a scorer to help supplement what Note can do. And if he's going to be playing better defense and rebounding, keep the dude on the floor. And I think it gives you just a more natural and more organic sub for Wade or Jalen Williams if you can bring Kamani in off the bench. So that would probably be my thought. Um, let's see here. Tim Eskew says, keeps rolling off on me, man. There we go. I actually respect the fact that Muscleman is ruthless. Vanover had a bad little stretch. I was hoping he'd get put back in late to redeem himself. End on a personal positive note. But nope. <laughs> also, K.K. Robinson really gets opportunities. Of course, we don't watch those guys in practice, so there's a lot more to the coach's decisions than what we see on the court. But Eric Musselman certainly has a one-track mind. Win. That's it in a nutshell, man. Win at, at all costs, whatever it takes. You know, he's he's in a way he's a player's coach. The way he builds relationships with the guys, and you have to do that if you're going to be tough on them. Promotes them on social media, markets them, helps them build a brand, gets them in front of scouts. All that stuff is really important. He helps these guys a lot. But he's not worried about hurting feelings. You you lose that mentality real quick once you get in the NBA. You have to. And so that's true. Yeah, it was, a, it was a rough stretch there for Connor. I was excited to see him go in, but, you know, South Carolina's a big physical team. They, they kind of manhandled him in there a little bit and, you know, had to get him out. And then with KK, you know, more of the same. He, he's going to get his looks there, here and there. He, he's got to take advantage of them. You know, he did get in um, against LSU. I, I thought there was an opportunity there with JD and, and some foul trouble. Uh, Devo was, you know, he lost his tooth. We haven't even talked about that. Devo lost his damn tooth. And, uh, you know, he's, he might have been a little loopy, a little out of it. He was turning it over. So he kind of needed a guard at, at that stage. And 
uh, you know, KK came in and, and kind of made the errant pass right there and, and turned it over and came back out. So it's a confidence thing for him. It's got to start. You're right. We don't see what they do every day in practice. It's got to start there and and then obviously carry over into the game. Cedric White says, Kurt, what is Connor's player efficiency? We have to be negative big time when he comes into the game. Uh, why do they constantly call on him? You know, actually, you'd be surprised to know that he's one of the more efficient players on the team when it comes to the analytics and, and the per 40 numbers. And I, I think the reason, though, why that's the case is because usually – Connor's used in favorable matchups. We we know there are going to be times when, you know, uh, the opposing team's center is, is super athletic and, and can run the floor and things like that. It's not a great matchup for Connor. Or teams that do a lot of middle pick and roll, it, it, that's tough on him as a defender. Not a great matchup, so they don't use him. But when it's favorable and, and there's someone similar to him <clears throat> or a slower tempo game or whatever, uh, they use him, and, and typically he's effective, and that's why he started nine games in a row because Arkansas is better uh, when he was on the floor for those stretches. Um, he understands the offense, moves the ball well. He can be a rim protector in there. I think at this point now, you know, we've really seen that fade. He's had a lot of games where he hasn't even gotten in at all lately or it's just really short spurts. He just hasn't played a lot. You know, he kind of got thrown to the wolves. They needed him last night. And it's no excuse. I mean, this, he's been in college, and this is like his fourth year now. So, uh, you know, if, if that's going to be your role, you got to be ready to embrace it. Uh, but but he struggled in there last night. But, yeah, it's it's interesting. If you look at the, you know, the player efficiency numbers, um, you know, the most efficient lineups that Arkansas puts on the floor, Connor's in like every one of those. But it's because he's a matchup-dependent player, and, and they use him when it's favorable. And they probably still will. MP Rich says, winning is more important than a streak, but would have been nice. Yeah. I agree. I agree. The streak has ended. <clears throat> Todd Drake says, are we still recruiting Anthony Black? Yes. Arkansas still involved there. Cedric White says, seems the turnaround started to happen when Note started looking to get more involved and Williams became more aggressive. <clears throat> yeah. I think the biggest thing with J.D. Note is he's started to get more aggressive off the dribble, get into the rim. We've seen him finishing more around the basket, getting to the free throw line more, and not just settling for some of those wild threes that he takes. And I'm sure that they've preached that to him. Part of that is kind of shifting over to the point guard role. It's important for him to be able to get into the teeth of the defense. He can dish it off, finish, whatever he needs to do. He's also played, you know, right around 30 minutes or, or even a little bit less during these three games. And I wonder, you know, if he's out there for, for 39, 40 minutes of what he's asked to do, does he get tired sometimes and just on some possessions just go, nah, I'm just going to chuck it? Does he settle a little bit because he's fatigued? I don't know. But, yeah, I, I agree with you with, with Note looking to get more involved, um, get the other guys going. That, that's been important. Last night and in the last few games, and Jalen Williams, him getting more aggressive, I mean, it's key. It's been absolute key. I mean, three double-doubles in a row, should have had one last night. That's fantastic. And, you know, Arkansas doesn't need him to be a go-to scorer. They just need him to be a threat. And so they're getting him in that six to eight shot attempts per game range. He's getting to the free throw line. When you add that to everything else that he does well, it makes him an all-SEC caliber player. really does. <clears throat> really does. Good signs for the Razorbacks. Okay. Cool. I think that'll do it for today. Remember, Arkansas and Texas A&M this weekend, that's Saturday, 7.30. It's kind of a weird tip-off time for a Saturday. 7.30 p.m., Bud Walton Arena. I believe that's going to be an SEC network if you can't make it. Then that trip to Ole Miss is next Wednesday, which means we will be back for Hog Hoops Live on Thursday. I mean, could you imagine how much fun that'll be if we get a couple a couple more wins here for the Hogs? Come back here on Thursday, 15-5, and 5-3 five, five and three in the league. Previewing a big game against West Virginia. Sign me up for that. Let's speak that into existence. All right. Hey, thank you guys as always for tuning in. Really do appreciate the support. Hope you enjoy listening to me ramble about the Razorbacks. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>